Thank you very much to all three speakers. My question is for, for Hin Din. I'm very grateful and very excited to learn more about what's going on inside, inside China at the sub-national level. I wondered a little more, I want to know a little bit more, I suppose, about the process that you mentioned uh, of competition, the fierce competition that goes on between local provinces and municipalities for central government support. Could you just cast a little light on that process of how it actually takes place? And secondly, uh, related to this, I, uh, you presented a very positive picture of the role of local government in, the industri in local industrial policy, but I want a little bit about the downside in this area. You hinted at it in the conclusion, you talked about the environmental cost, but I wonder what other downsides there might be there. Thank you. Okay, um, well, Sam and then Justin, and then we'll come back to, uh, or maybe I'll take Carol as well, although I'm showing left-hand bias here, I must Yeah, thank you very much. That was very fascinating. Uh, uh, maybe it's a blessing these guys that uh, John did not uh, <coughs> stick to cutting them short. So we benefited in the process. Well, now let me just ask about the, the incentive structure which makes provinces or municipalities perform. Um, what is behind uh, the, the performance uh, dynamism there? But secondly, is, uh, uh, I think I like the idea of uh, learning from good practices within the uh, country. Uh, like the case of Penang is very outstanding. What makes Penang stand out? And uh, what slows down the learning from others? Uh, uh, because it clearly stands out, and I'm not sure what the dynamic forces are there. Uh, three, support to training. Uh, what forms of support to training were seen in practice? Is it subsidization, free training, or what is it? Um, next is R&D, um, which is uh, shown there. Is it, is it uh, based on a broad LGA, local government support, or is it firm-based, uh, or a combination of that? Uh, lastly, is the, um, I think that I, I like the idea of uh, the Eric coming through the back door to industrial policy, as uh, uh, Paul has said. I think the message is uh, uh, quite clear. What I was wondering is uh, the, whether there is a balance between the cost of stagnating and the cost of making mistakes in trying to be strategic in interve intervening. Because uh, normally the latter is emphasized very much, that no, 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 government will make mistakes. But uh, as clearly shown, liberalization has made mistakes. Uh, uh, so the, I wonder whether either the next research or whether you have come across, can we weigh the, 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 the traders, traders and, and weigh the two sides and see whether we shouldn't really go back to uh, tolerating mistakes which later may lead to dynamism in the industry? Well, uh, my question, and uh, related to Hin's presentation, and uh, I happy to see that you had a very good study of how China support some traditional sectors, <coughs> like you know garment, footwear, you know, furniture, and so on. But if you look into the success of China in the past thirty years, you know China from a very inward-looking country to now the global you know the world factories, and uh, export increase from less than 10% of China's GDP, now to more than 50% of China's GDP. And China, you know, the export, if you look into the competition, actually the majority of the export are in new sectors. For example, ICD products, electronics, and those kind of sectors did not exist in China in the 1980s at all. And uh, the success of China to enter into those kind of new industries actually is also a result of very active the government foreign uh, and, uh, investment promotion to attract foreign direct investment. Or even the government you know, started to play the entrepreneurship uh, uh, function, for example, to invest in those kind of sectors and they were owned by the government locally. And, and, and so in that regards, I think that your conclusion to say that Chinese government only backed the winners seemed to be incomplete because a lot of sectors are new to China. And the government, you know, active support 
is also very important, just like in the Malaysia's case, you know, to cultivate the multinational companies to come to China, or to support, you know, to, to develop those kind of sectors by the government itself, direct involvement. So, you know, I'd like to hear your reaction about, you know, this kind of function. If Chinese government actually, you know, try to support the new sectors, they must to pick the new sectors. And so, how to balance the story that you have with the reality in China? I think we've got a long collection of questions there, so let me go back to the panel, and then I'll come back to everybody again for another round. But Hin, I think. Thank you very much for the very, very perceptive questions. Uh, let me start off with uh, Justin's um, point, because I think that's, uh, in fact, it probably covers a lot of the uh, other areas. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the uh, local government support in China is not one size fit all. It actually, actually varies from locality to locality. And there's no question that the local government uh, have helped promote the production of new industries as well as um, the, existing in the, uh, the existing products coming from the private sector. I think what Justin was talking about was applying more recently in terms of the high-tech uh, high tech industries, for example, um, in the electronic, in the computer industry. But when China started out in the 1980 uh, or the 1990s, I think it was more uh, the private sector initiative first. Um, and I think I've seen, actually, I've talked to a lot of local government where they have an explicit, an explicit policies to promoting new products. That is true. Um, but also behind each and every uh, successful story in China, there's also all the uh, failing that we don't know. And I don't know to what extent the ideas of having new products will be entirely successful. I think time could only tell. Um, when I look at the existing battle of production in, in, in China today, there's a lot of um, progress in terms of technological, in terms of, uh, uh, you could see that, you know, by looking at the composition of Chinese exports over the years. Um, it's very hard to separate out which part of it belongs to the uh, local government's support for new products and which part of it is actually coming from private sector. So I take your point, Justin. I think uh, we, probably, we probably should mention that that is also play a role in helping uh, the variety of exports in China is to become uh, better and better over time. That, I think that's, uh, that's a well taken point. Um, so there was a, a question on the downsides of the competition of the local governments. And I think the downsides of it, I, I mentioned briefly, is that when local governments are really compete to grow, then there was a disregard of the environmental impact that was back in the 1980s, 1990s. I think that problem has been more or less fixed today with the very clear guideline from the central government on, uh, on, on the environmental impact. But in the beginning, in the mid-1990s, when local governments were let free to just compete and all the promotion was based entirely on the, you know, how fast your economy can grow, how fast your local community can grow, not just your locality, but in relation to others, then they compete like a crazy to pollute. And that's why there was a, there was a saying somehow that uh, there was a period in which uh, uh, local government compete to pollute. I think the pollution was related to the growth incentives given. So I guess that's... Uh, uh, thank you, Sam, for your for your questions. <clears throat> the first thing Penang did in re in relation to uh, inviting multinationals was to go and learn from Shannon International Airport, uh, the first export processing zone, and subsequently Kaohsiung, 
which was the first one in Asia and Singapore, uh, to look at how they attracted multinationals. And one important point that, that remains useful for countries seeking to attract for the first time multinationals, especially when you, when you have a crisis. In the case of Malaysia, we had just come out of a bloody ethnic uh, crisis. Uh, there was bloodshed in 1969 was to provide incentives um, in order to write off uncertainties and risks before you can first prove to the multinationals that you can indeed uh, perform. So the first two export processing zones were actually started in Penang, and they were actually the bargaining points the chief minister used with the federal government. The rest of the other export processing zones came as a consequence of him convincing them that these are important to create jobs. Now, th that's, that's the first part. And, Again, to me, it's not so much um, um, in relation to the state government incentives given to them. It's the pressure the Penang government faced in delivering to the constituencies because they had just defeated the federal government uh, political parties then. Now, it's the pressure that required that they perform, which means to say that the state also hired officials to run all these massive organizations, uh, Penang Development Corporation, subsequently Penang Skills Development Center, with very... Um, 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 merit-based capable um, experts. And this is a question John has been uh, raising in a, in a different Quaker project uh, about political capture. Uh, in here, you don't have a, uh, the room for political capture that the federal government would face in the sense that they tended to hire people who were of the uh, Bumiputra time, the, largely the Malays, in the, in the rest of the other organizations. So you don't have, you have that detachment, including we both admire Tun Mahathir, uh, but let me mention that he, from 1981, when he became prime minister, till the first major crisis, he was such a strong nationalist to the point where he just stopped giving incentives to multinationals. But while being a strong nationalist, he didn't take the steps Pak Chung he did. He didn't really uh, hire people with proven um, um, tacit experience in industry. He put all these guys there to run the show. We have protons there now. Uh, which Homi thinks shouldn't be there. <laughs> a national car that isn't really bringing profits, but um, it is still there for national pride. So in that, uh, that, that's a point I'd like to mention. But also you have to uh, know that the Penang government, to some extent, was able to. This is like, if firms are not performing, you expect them to be liquidated. You don't want what um, uh, Kaushik mentioned the other day. Uh, to, to liquidate in firms that were employment size are more than 100, it will be uh, simply impossible because of the, of the unions. But in this case here, they were willing to remove officials who did not perform. Um, um, you didn't have that elsewhere. Um, in other words, the, the chief minister himself was willing to go and remove these people simply because his own um, uh, position depended on the performance of the state. Now, likewise, the, the collaboration that came, uh, came with, uh, with the multinationals, that's part of the reason why I like this evolutionary argument, the need to understand the dynamics of industry, industry um, um, shaping, in the, uh, industry itself shaping industrial policy rather than one where you just create a, an environment and, and firms just respond. What trans uh, uh, happened was an example of state failure will be when people were talking about a lack of diversification in the electronics industry, the state took it like, we need to move out from semiconductors. We need to have consumer electronics, industrial electronics. Little did they realize consumer electronics and industrial electronics were more labor intensive, less knowledge intensive than, say, semiconductors. So they attracted these disk drive firms, um, um, uh, firms that assembled uh, re um, um, television sets and so on. That only lasted for five years, they realized not only that these firms required large workforces, but they were bringing down uh, skills. And now if you see in Penang, you don't see these firms anymore. They were, in other words, Penang was ready for quick renewals. They made a policy mistake, they were able to correct the mistake. Governments fail all the time. <laughs> we have to accept that element of it. It's, and in the case of Penang, they were flexible enough, realizing that unless they perform, the opposition parties would win. In any case, the opposition parties are ruling now in Penang. So I'd like to just, in the interest of time, uh, this guy uh, discuss this, this point. But they didn't have, let me put it to you, they didn't have the capacity to access 
R&D grants, for, uh, for example, simply because they, there's all these national um, um, uh, regulations that require um, um, that you hire um, um, the Malays, and you have um, uh, even to start start a company, and uh, you need to have something like uh, thirty percent equity uh, from them. These were constraints they faced. Despite those constraints, they have performed uh, to the level they have achieved. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So the question was, how do you balance uh, mistakes in mistakes of liberalization with mistakes of intervention, essentially? And I don't, I don't have a, a one size fits all answer to that question, um, but I think it's the right question to be asking, right? So thinking about these balance between, say, government failure and market failure is exactly what we should, what the discussion should be about, not just. And you're right, that, uh, I guess now it's changing quickly, but, but when I was coming up and I was in grad school, everything was about all, all government failures, government, fail government failures, and so reduce, um, reduce the amount of intervention. Um, uh, the, the, the two slides I didn't uh, show were about um, as uh, sort of different strategies in industrial policy. So one would be something like preferential tax treatment for targeted sectors. Um, one thing that I'm working on with co-authors uh, to, to tr to try and develop is a sort of a matching grant program where firms have to come with innovative ideas, which then a, a board would decide, um, would choose, select among them the most, the most promising, which has the advantage that the board or the officials don't have to come up with the ideas themselves. Or it requires less knowledge about um, what's, what's on the horizon, what's, what's, what are promising ideas. It's arguably more vulnerable to capture and to corruption than a simple preferential tax treatment for a sector. Um, so that's, again, something else that has to be weighed. But that seems to me a promising direction to, to, to go in thinking about industrial policy. OK, with your kind permission, I'm going to take another round of questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I owe Carol a, a call. But then I also got to get over on this side. So John, and then back here. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Let's try that. The shorter the questions, the longer the answers can be. I'll be really quick. Um, so my question is, is mainly for Raja, but also for, for, for Hindin, and it's about um, the fact that you, you both mentioned, you know, especially in, in Raja's case, when the multinational companies um, led to a lot of spin-off um, um, local suppliers in the upstream sector supplying, supplying inputs. And I'm just wondering whether that happened organically or whether there was policies in place to make that happen. And also, do you have a sense of how, how well these suppliers survived and how did they do? Um, and this is kind of a similar question for, for Hindin in terms of the development of these fully integrated supply chains. Do you have any examples of exactly how that happened? Was it through contracts? Was it through setting up new enterprises, state-owned enterprises? Just a sense of how that happened would be, would be interesting. Thank you. Uh, th this is for Eric. Um, I thought that was a really uh, intriguing story about the um, uh, uh, disappointing post-NAFTA growth in Mexico, um, that the uh, uh, liberalized trade skewed the industrial distribution and uh, 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 the composition in, in a certain direction. But I have questions both about the evidence and about the policy implications. So you use plant level R&D as uh, uh, at the end um, and look at the share of, um, of plants in the industries. But R&D is not usually a plant level uh, activity. It's a, it's a, a company level. And you're, um, you have very high rates of R&D at the plant level in your, in your survey. So lots of industries with more than 50% of plants carrying out uh, R&D uh, strikes me as kind of odd. But more fundamentally, um, productivity growth comes about I mean, is not necessarily that closely connected with with R and D or with innovation. It takes place through adoption, as well, and and, and various kinds of catch up mechanisms. So I wonder why you didn't consider using some sort of international productivity growth by industry as a, it, would, it would be at least another thing to look at. About the the, the policy conclusions, I'm I'm a little bit confused because at one point you said that uh, uh, the government doesn't have any special informational advantage, and therefore more hor horizontal kinds of approaches like R and subsidies would make sense uh, uh, because of the externalities. But um, then at some point, you seem to be supporting more targeted uh, uh, sectoral interventions. And on your list, there were a, a couple of specific sectors like uh, high-grade steel or something like that. And you mentioned that also in your response to previous questions. So I wonder where you want to come down on that uh, more specific question about the type of industrial policy. I will do it very quickly. Uh, John Rand from University of Copenhagen. Uh, 
First question to Eric. Um, I'm not surp uh, that surprised about your result if you compare your results to uh, the result of uh, a learn where you learned from exporting. Because if you compare the two exporters that the I, I, maquilladores uh, to the other uh, exporters, they have lower in innovation rates and that is what you show. But we expect lower in raising rates in lower value added sectors because of if they export and learn less in lower value added sectors as that literature is showing. So we should expect to see lower in raising rates if we believe in, believe in the learning by exporting story. If that translates into knowledge, uh, but, uh, we can talk about that later. Then I have a general question to all of you. It's uh, about agglomeration. A lot of the academic literature is, has difficulties in finding agglomeration effects. And we are still promoting industrial parks. We have an example in, in Vietnam where we see a lot of unfilled space in industrial parks and all. So some of the firms are actually picking up that it might not be as beneficial as we are all saying all the time. So why is that? And uh, why can we not find the positive effects in the agglomeration literature? So thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Donald Imar from Repo. Um, my question regards the last bullet uh, by Eric that uh, we need more research to establish the positive or negative evidence of uh, industrial policies. But in my opinion, they do exist. Uh, China, for example, seems to be a positive uh, uh, evidence of uh, working industrial policy, South Korea. There are some selective sectors also in Africa, for example, in Ethiopia. But there are also, of course, uh, uh, areas where industrial policy has failed. So what I think we need more research is why industrial policies works in some countries or in some sectors and not in others. That was my question. Okay, with the full knowledge that they're standing between you and lunch, I'm going to start with Eric and just work my way down. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, John, so the, this R&D measure, part of the reason I put the whole full language on there is because I think it's different from our other R&D measures that people typically use. And in general, it's really capturing any sort of upgrading, essentially asking the plant you know, whether they're doing any sort of upgrading. It's true we might like to have that at the firm level, but the data is at the plant level, and you know, you know, most of these guys are, are single, single plant establishments. So I think that, that, that explains um, part of it. And I think in particular it includes uh, whether they're adopting new technologies, not just whether they're... Um, doing R&D in sort of the way we typically th think of it. So I think that is included in the, in the measure, which is part of the reason why I like it. But your point about shouldn't we do you know, TFP measures um, is also well taken, right? And so there is evidence that I cited the Lopez Cordova paper about that NAFTA was having effect, positive effects on, on, on TFP. Um, so that would be a much more positive sort of view of the effect of NAFTA on, on, on productivity growth. But, but I agree, there's more, more, more work to be done there. Um, you asked about where do I come down on the sectoral promotion policy. So I, I, I cut off a little bit, I, and I mentioned the matching grants. So I, th I think with the, the, my basic answer to that is um, uh, that I, this sort of matching grant model seems to me more promising than the sectoral promotion model. Uh, I, I listed what Vietnam was doing because it seemed sort of in line with what I was talking about. But, but, uh, but I, I like the matching grant idea. Now, with the caveat that you need you know, that subject to, that's vulnerable to capture. And so you, you, know, you only want to try that, I think, in, in, in situations where you can be pretty sure that your board or whoever it is that's making decisions about these things is, is not going to be captured, which is not true in many places. And so, so that's, I don't, I don't want to push it too hard, but, I, but that's the, sort of the direction I'm going. Um, about the learning by exporting, so I'm not sure that's exactly what's going on because these guys are, are exporting a lot, right? Even the maquilas are exporting, you know, there's 95, everything's exported, right? Uh, which isn't true about all the, you know, everybody, all apparel firms in Mexico, but, but, um, but so I don't think the story is that they're, you know, the, so if it were just learning by exporting story, then this, this would have been the right strategy because that, those are the goods, Mexico is specializing in the goods that it's going to export to the U.S., which are the apparel and electronics and that sort of thing. So, so I, think some, I think it's something else is going on. Uh, Uh, thank you for the question. If we're looking at suppliers um, that actually evolved in Penang, um, because I mentioned that Penang itself doesn't have the capacity to introduce its own uh, industrial policy, it's at the national level. They have the first industrial mass supply and the second and the third. Penang felt discriminated in relation to the targeting of, say, uh, incentives for those who are willing to, to participate in the supply process. 
Well, what I'm meaning here is really the workforce that evolved in the multinationals. Um, it's somewhat like the, the, those guys who enjoyed all this experience and went back to Korea and Taiwan from the US. We also have that kind of individuals, not brought back, but here, People who worked in the multinationals themselves, a lot of them are in Singapore now because the incentives are there for them to perform there. Uh, in fact, in some firms, about 50% of the engineers are from these kinds of firms. Now, these guys recognized in the mid-80s that there was this uh, capacity to supply um, um, what Michael Best calls uh, um, um, uh, constraint in one firm becomes an opportunity in another firm. So if you have a problem of, say, suddenly having to fix uh, something to do with uh, adapting a machinery and so on, then it's an opportunity for a supplier firm to do simply because the supplier firm can amortize investments by supplying many other uh, firms. Now, in that, that sort of sense, from the mid-80s, you saw the growth of that through largely the relocation of engineers, uh, production foremen, and so on, because they saw the opportunity. And the Penang government was very happy to support by way of uh, arranging licensing and so on uh, very quickly. So, in other words, you would classify Penang government's role as facilitative rather than really uh, aggressively interventionist, no. Now, that's simply because Penang state, um, 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 largely run by, by uh, Chinese, Malaysian Chinese. Now, what really happened subsequently is that you don't see the transformation of that to suppliers who became like, say, uh, what Maurice Chang uh, pioneered in Taiwan, um, that you have contract manufacturers in, in wafer fabrication only because you need all this upfront grant. Uh, it's an extremely expensive start with a fabrication. And in the case of uh, Taiwan too, the E3 labs, also uh, electronics um, research and service organization, this organization actually acquired RCA in 1978. That became uh, UMC in 1980. He was the uh, Sinchu Science Industrial Park director then. Then subsequently when they had this joint venture with, uh, uh, with Philips, 87, that's TSMC, he moved on to do that. Now we did, Penang didn't have that sort of opportunity to upgrade supply capacity to that sort of level. The highest level they would have got is to become global service providers. An example would be TransCapital, which was also having a subsidy. I heard from uh, Rafael that Intel is leaving Costa Rica. I was in Costa Rica in San Jose, um, um, only one, one semiconductor firm, largely because the president uh, negotiated, uh, the Intel CEO negotiated directly with the president, they, they went there. But in this case, the suppliers, including Malaysian suppliers, are there. That, that's the highest level they went. And the role of Penang State is really facilitative here. Thank you. Um, there was a question on specifically how China actually built up the upstream and downstream industries. I think they've done it through a number of uh, channels. One of them I mentioned is, for example, in the case of Iwu meat products, not only they provide subsidies on land, subsidies on credit for the meat product factory, but they also give subsidies to the farmers producing feeds for hogs using in the meat product, because you know, meat is, uh, they use hogs, they use um, um, hogs. So uh, that's one way. And then the same, the very same local government, Igu, also build a large, very large um, market, they call it market, uh, for the metal subsectors to bring, so that all the producers of the metal products can bring their products into one place. And there, you know, I was visiting that one and I saw a couple of uh, ladies from Kenya and was asking, you know, what Kenya was uh, doing there. And the lady was actually going on the way from Kenya to buy the locks. And that's one place that they can, instead of going to various producers and not knowing how much and not knowing the they have a, they just come to a, a huge marketplace where you could see hundreds and even thousands of, of, of lock, you know, little small lock, you know, coming from, from, from Igu. So these are the kind of, of uh, channels that, that uh, they produce. They also uh, aim to build a lot of uh, the facilitating um, infrastructure that can help uh, the downstream uh, activities. So, for example, in the case of the shoes, I think it was the uh, Chandu shoes, they started building the so-called um, the, uh, the auxiliary material for the downstream manufacturing by providing a lot of subsidies to, um, to the industries. Um, and as a result, you know, within the period of eight, 
nine years from a very obscure producer of shoes. They actually produce shoes that um, uh, Obama's, you know, the the, the uh, wife of the President Obama actually was wearing in the um, uh, in the first uh, inauguration. Uh, all of that is described in the book, and I'll leave it there.